And today we will be going through BI dashboards and smart workflows, um, a little bit of an agenda. Um, so we'll do a bit of an introduction first. Um, we'll have a bit of a talk about the background of BI dashboards and smart workflows. Then we'll move on to the, the main content of this presentation. So around you know, how would you plan for a BI dashboard and smart workflow project? We'll have um, a conclusion at the end of it. So we'll do a bit of a roundup and then we'll have some, hopefully some time for some Q&A at the end. So moving on to the introductions. So who am I? Um, so my name is Sam Sheldon. Um, I'm the principal consultant in the FPNA stream at Pinnacle. Um, I've been in legal for about 18 years or so. Um, previous roles have been uh, product manager at Big Hands, uh, technical manager at DW Reporting, and I've been in-house at a couple of law firms. So a bit of a background on Pinnacle very briefly. So Pinnacle have been around for about uh, 12 years or so. They've got about 140 consultants um, over the world. We've just opened a new office in APAC. Um, and we work with a large majority of the AM law and UK top 100 law firms. Uh, we've got three streams at Pinnacle. So we've got our consulting stream, our managed services stream, and our software stream. Um, on screen, you can see um, a few of the clients that we work with in those streams. Uh, and we've also got partnerships with a number of the large um, legal software vendors as well that you can see on the screen. So um, I predominantly at Big Hand work with the Microsoft Legal Apps team there. Um, and we, we specialize in the uh, Microsoft Power Platform. So we build uh, Power BI dashboards, we build Power Apps for clients, we work with Power Automate for integrations, and we build chatbots um, in virtual agents. From a data connector perspective, um, we work with Elite, Adherence, Intap, we work on-premise and in the cloud, uh, and we're finding a lot of our conversations with clients at the moment, um, the kind of the integration side of of the Microsoft um, Power Platform and their kind of core business um, solutions. It's quite a high priority conversation, especially with clients who are now moving into the cloud um, with those types of solutions. So just a bit of a background about BI dashboards and smart workflows and kind of what we, what we mean by that. So I'm sure most of you have come across uh, BI dashboards at your firms, you may have you may use them, you may have built them. Um, so BI dashboards really are a great way to um, get people around the firm um, to kind of focus on what the firms or their teams or their individual KPIs are. You know, it's a great way to bring a number of sources together. So say you've got kind of disparate systems that sit around. You know, it's a great way to pull, say, HR information and market information, as well as your financial information, um, into a single place uh, that people can come to. And that's kind of their, their portal into, you know, their, their key focused information. Um, so where does, where does smart workflows come into it? So smart workflows are really a way to add another dimension to your kind of BI reporting and, and business processes. So when we talk about smart workflows, it's really um, interaction um, with your kind of core business systems. So whether that's a, say a PMS system or a HR system or say something like Intap, in being able to um, interact with those systems through APIs or web services or um, stock or custom connectors. Um, from another platform. So say it's Power BI or say it's Microsoft Teams. Um, lots of our conversations at the moment with clients are around, um, you know, how can you embed something like a Power App into existing Power BI reports they've got that allow them to um, do things like raise invoices, edit time cards. And we, we've already worked with a number of clients on those types of things. Um, various different ways to, to get to that type of information or have a starting point. So as I mentioned, Power BI, but 
you can also have starting points um, like teams. So we've been working with clients recently to um, pull types of their business processes they go through on a daily basis into teams. So a couple of examples on the screen at the moment. One of them um, links up to 3E, uses the 3E web services and allows you to um, query that, pull back um, time cards, uh, and then push them through to a performer that is then generated um, in the front end of 3E. Uh, the second is something that we've been working with a client on around our Pitch Perfect product, which allows them to use natural language in Teams to search across the Pitch Perfect database, really just to um, help their users bring together information for a pitch. So they're able to um, search for individuals in that system, bring up their bios, they can edit them. Um, we're also working on bringing financial information into there. So historical client and matter billings and, um, and client discount information that again, uh, would lead into those um, those pitch documents and those pitch conversations with clients. So, I mean, there's there's lots of applications across firms for these. Um, we're finding that when we go into clients to talk about these things, it might be that what we've kind of done at other clients isn't necessarily um, the starting point for that client. It might be that they can see the application of this in a different area of their business. Um, I was having a conversation with a client the other day around um, knowledge articles and using this type of uh, natural language search in Teams to be able to search across their knowledge articles, just allowing users to be able to bring back that information they need um, in, a, in, in, a, in a quick fashion. Um, they don't need to go through lots of documents. You know, it's, it, it, it's already um, within Teams and they can search across it. So moving on to planning a BI dashboard and smart workflow project. So, so how would you go about doing that? Um, so really, these projects can be quite large. What we've kind of focused on as part of this, uh, as part of this um, presentation is, you know, what are the key areas that you need to, you to tackle as part of these projects? Um, so starting off with what the key questions to ask. So really, there are four key, key questions. One of them is, you know, what are your strategic goals and design outcomes? Um, who are the actors, the key actors and contributors around the firm? Uh, what tools we use to communicate um, those insights? And how can we measure our success? So starting with the first item, so step one, um, identifying your firm's strategic goals. So every firm will be different with how they, um, with what goals they have, how they go about um, identifying their goals. But just a couple of examples um, of goals that law firms um, might have. It might be that, you know, your focus on financial performance. So you're, you know, you're increasing your revenue. You want to reduce your AR. Um, it might be that you've got goals around and strategies around. Uh, operational change. So maybe you've got a number of routine tasks internally that you want to um, uh, move into a smart workflow. Maybe you want to um, automate your billing process. Um, maybe your firm's one of the firms that's going through an M&A at the moment, and you want to be able to monitor how that M&A is going. So having a look at things like um, client and uh, client and employee retention or kind of cross-sell across um, across those units. Um, or maybe organic growth. So maybe you're opening a new practice or you're growing a practice. Maybe you're offering, um, say, new fee arrangements to clients and you want to see, you know, how, how those are hopefully a bit more lucrative and kind of grow areas of the business. Um, so the key is kind of identify what those strategic goals are. Um, there's a couple of pre-existing frameworks that you can use to um, help you assess those. So I'm sure you've come across SMART or SWOT before, um, or you can use something like a, a goals matrix. So with a, with a goals matrix, um, again, every firm will be different. There'll be different um, supply and demand levers, um, but the concept is really the same. Um, so in the examples here, 
we're just looking at um, the different levels of strategies that you might have um, with our kind of X and Y axis. We've just looked at um, resource cost versus time. Uh, and then when you start to kind of drill into each of those levels of strategies, so in this example, at a firm level, um, you might have strategies that can filter down the whole business. So with something like, um, say, reducing your missing time by 20%, that's something that can be a firm level strategy. But actually, could be the, the strategy all the way down the firm to um, you know the individual lawyer at the end of it. But then again, you might have strategies that are just at firm level. So, say you have in this example an M and A that you want to you want to go through. Um, what you can do as well is with these matrices is start to go down to the level underneath it. So, when we start to look at something like a team strategy. Again, there may be things that are filtered down. So in this example, um, reduce missing time by 20%. But there might also be indirect strategies. So one of the strategies at a firm level was um, increasing their profit by 5%. Now, when we look at um, a, team, a team level, um, they may have a strategy around, say, increasing their leverage percentage. So they want to reduce the reliance of partners, so less partner time for kind of non-partners on each matter. So with doing that, you'd hopefully be um, spending more time um, from uh, kind of lower level individuals within that firm. So um, say you want to push work down to say a paralegal and hopefully um, they would have a lower cost base. So they'd have a higher profit number. Um, and that in itself you'd hope would um, change your or increase your profit which might be an indirect strategy so it's not necessarily the exact same strategies that you have at a firm level but it does impact that firm level strategy also as part of these projects you want to have a look at the individual users um, and different departments around the firm um, understand what their specific needs and, and goals are um, so there are a few examples on screen of different areas, you know, what, what they manage. Um, understanding of those departments, you know, what are their, what, what's their rank priority in their, in their kind of strategies and KPIs? Um, what are their immediate goals? What are their long-term goals? Can things be phased? And then starting to think about, you know, what, what content do we want to um, do we want to put in front of these individuals? And that's something that we'll move on to a bit um, later in this presentation. That also leads on as well to, to KPIs. So working out what, what are the key KPIs that you want to show in your, show in your dashboards to, to kind of measure your success. Um, so just a couple of examples on the screen. So financial performance, you might be looking at um, revenue, you might be looking at profitability. Um, for an operational change perspective, um, say you've say you've changed your um, billing process to be an automated billing process, so you've moved it away from being manual. Um, that's where process cycle time comes in. So maybe you want to analyze, you know, how long something used to take versus how long it takes now, um, or maybe productivity. So with anything like that, any type of workflow change. Um, you'd hopefully be reducing um, the interaction time of people who are involved in that process. So, you know, as part of that, you'd hope that your admin hours would be reduced down. You'd hope that your chargeable hours would go up or your effective hours would go up. Um, so those are things that you can kind of think of um, to have in your, your, your dashboards. Um, and maybe even M&A. So if you're going through an M&A, as I mentioned before, um, employee and client retention percentages. Um, or even cross-sell, so you can understand how well that integration is, is going, you know, how many people um, on the uh, kind of parent firm, you know, how many of them are interacting, what matter are they working on within the firm that's been acquired. Also, if you want to start looking at things from a department perspective, um, so things like uh, in, the example, in this example, um, human resources, marketing, IT, this human resources side, um, they may want to have some KPIs around um, employee turnover rate or, or time to hire. You know, how efficient is that process? You know, how long does it take? Maybe even the talent gaps. So where are there gaps um, within 
So business services or the lawyers that you want to be able to fill, you know, what, what, what do you need for that, for that next job role? Um, on the marketing side, so client acquisition costs, that there's always, there's always a cost of sale. There's always a, a cost to bring a new client into the business. So, you know, understanding, understanding that what, what that is, so you can hopefully look to, re to reduce that um, on the next one. A uh, campaign ROI. Now that's always a tricky one to kind of, um, to have a line directly back to, to revenue. But if there's a way that you can have that type of information visible to the users on a dashboard, you know, you can you can start to make that connection between the two. Hopefully your revenue will go up based on um, any kind of big campaigns that you're that you're doing in any area. Um, or maybe IT. So maybe you've input a, a, a chat bot um, to help with your um, service desk, um, understanding the number of responses to that, that chat bot is giving. You know that's reducing down your kind of human interaction time. Um, also, things like ticket ticket turnaround times. Again, you know, looking at how efficient that that process is. And then finally, on here, um, just wanted to talk about the concept of good data versus useful data at law firms. This is one that comes up um, in our projects at clients, and starting to think about you know. Good data. Um, data is a lot more accessible now um, than it was a number of years ago. There's a lot more ways to get data out of systems. There's a lot more ways to integrate data, join it together. Um, but there's a question around, you know, what's good data versus what's useful data. So a couple of examples, think about PMS system data. It might be that a client has several years of historical metadata. You know, that's that that's great. But it's understanding what in that is the useful information. So it's kind of extracting that or generating the useful information from that. So in that example, you know, you want to know the trends, you want to know matter profitability, you want to understand your gearing and resource allocation across those matters. You know, that it might be that you're trying to target um, reducing that again, it, it, reducing that down to a lower cost base that will um, ultimately affect your, your bottom line, hopefully increase it. Things around HR, so employee headcount and trainee data in the HR system. Um, that's great, you've got it, but it's then having a look at, you know, your your retention, your turnover um, predictions. You know, you can see where there are certain areas of the business where maybe you need to increase the headcount, um, or maybe it's, it's decreased in an area because people have left. Um, looking at talent gaps again if uh, coming back to when you're looking to bring new employees in what type of skill sets are you looking for or is there any areas that you need to start training your staff into um, that then leads on to the um, the learning and resource side of it you know the, the, the sorry the learning and development side of it um, empl uh, also employee well-being as well you know that's a big one that comes up at the moment um, works with a couple of law firms who are trying to implement ways into their dashboards to kind of capture that employee well-being, whether it's, you know, a smiley face on a daily basis, um, clicking whether it's a smiley face or a sad face. Um, you know, there are lots of different ways that you can do that and visual ways to, to collect that information. So just a little bit of a recap on that first part. Um, so what have we kind of gone through? So um, talked about identifying your strategic goals and using any kind of pre-existing frameworks that exist to, uh, to assess them. Um, starting to understand the needs of each user group um, and try to create a plan that encompasses uh, all of those user groups and departments. Um, and then assess data on its merits. So good data is not always useful data. So understanding you know, how much data you wanna pull in, you know, where are you gonna be using that data? So moving on to step two, so key actors and their contributions. Um, so having a look at the, you know, the people behind the data um, and understanding as part of your project, you know, who's, who's involved with that? Um, who are the, the key stakeholders uh, and what are their roles and responsibilities in, in the project? Um, as you can see on screen, a couple of different, different stakeholders or actors um, shown there, and they may have um, all might have a different role in the project. There's a couple of different pre-existing frameworks that you can use to identify those people 
and um, what roles they have in the in the project. So I'm sure you've come across Racy and and Rapid. Um, but an example of that, um, a Rapid example, is just shown on screen. This just shows the different categories of contribution um, that individuals can make to a project. Um, it's great if you're able to assign um, assign this to individuals or groups at the start of a project. Um, hopefully it's on a phase task and activity level, um, but it just aids with you know, planning, visibility and accountability. You know, at each stage of the project, you know, who you need to go to, who has sign off for it, who needs to be aware of it. Um, it just helps keep those projects on, on track. Also as well, um, try and find champions internally for those projects. So um, champions can be in all areas of the business, um, really just to kind of help you drive that engagement, whether it's a, whether it's a dashboard, whether it's a, a new workflow process, um, whatever you're trying to do, try and get some kind of champions around the firm that can help you, help you drive that engagement, help you talk to people. Um, so just taking a step back for a second and having a think about um, you know a real world example so we touched on it before say you wanted to automate your billing workflow process so you've got a billing workflow process it's a manual process at the moment but you wanted to bring it into a smart workflow whether or not that was uh, kind of power automate um, or you know whether it's an intact product there are there are various ways that various tools around that allow you to do that um, but just looking at this process, there are a number of different steps that you have to go through. So I'd hope that um, most people on the, the call at their law firms, they do have some type of automated billing process. Um, but just saying this example, it's still quite manual. It's still kind of old school. Um, so in this example that we're looking at here, with all these different steps that you have to go through, um, say your starting point is the billing team, they raise the performer, um, they need to send that that performance of the partner. So it goes through general office, it goes to the secretary, goes through to the partner. The partner then um, makes amendments and sends it back to the team. You know, it goes back through the secretary, through to general office, through to the billing team. Billing team still have questions. So they email the partner, the partner responds, goes back to the billing team, and then ultimately out to the client. So, you know, there's a number of different um, departments that are involved in this process there's a number of different touch points and and lots of them are lots of them are manual um, so say you were going through a project where you wanted to try and automate this uh, and and this is this is one that we've we've done at a client um, so say you wanted to now um, move it to a, a, a smart workflow project and a, a and a power bi dashboard um, so your process slightly changes so your starting point really is your smart workflow. So it might be that you build into your smart workflow that your, um, your billing performer is raised on a monthly basis on a, on a certain schedule. That's then um, pushed out to your BI dashboard. So it's available um, on your BI dashboard as a notification. Um, then next step is um, your partner just means that your partner can now go into that BI dashboard. They can um, see that performance been raised. They can click on it. They can make any edits that they want to it. Um, and they can, at that point in time, they can approve it and send it off. Um, that then goes back into a smart workflow. Um, that goes through to the PMS. So it uses an API call um, into the PMS to raise that invoice. That information can then be passed back to the um, smart workflow. And at that point, you know, you could, as part of it, generate a PDF into the billing team. You can generate a PDF um, if you have an email address for the client or to the client. Um, and then it's available back on the Power BI dashboard so the partner can go in and see that invoice that's been raised. So that's just a, a, an example of where you can start to use those workflow processes just to reduce all of those um, kind of touch points and people involved in that process. So one of the things um, also that's quite good to do on projects um, is around the stakeholder map when you're thinking about them. Um, it can get quite 
large when you're looking at your your project so as you start to expand that out there are lots of different areas around the business you can have lots of different sponsors or stakeholders so within your projects trying to kind of map it out to see um, any type of impact so any, anything where you are changing a a workflow within a firm you know there's always going to be impact to a number of different areas um, and it might be that say you've got this down impact to um, IT well actually there might be several people within IT who are also involved in that so trying to kind of map that out um, to help with that impact analysis is always always a good thing so just a little bit of a recap on key actors and contributions and so what have we gone through? So one of the things to, or what are the key items, I should say? And um, so conduct a stakeholder analysis to identify the key actors and their roles and responsibilities. Um, try and use any pre-existing frameworks that are out there. Um, assign champions around the firm to help drive engagement. Uh, and then also try and draw up a, draw up, draw up a stakeholder map. Um, so, so it can really help with your um, with any kind of process change and, and what impacts that has around the firm and the different departments. So moving on to step three, so engines to communicate insights and trigger actions. So when we talk about engines, um, really it's the, you know, the mechanism and, and the tools that are used to deliver content to the users. Um, so a, a, as part of any project, you know, we want to um, assess the best way to, to deliver that to users. And it may, be, it may be different for different users. You know, we've got a couple of examples shown on the screen. For certain things, dashboards are great, very visual, very interactive. Um, you know, you can get people to focus on specifically what you want them to focus on. Um, but then reports, you know, it might be that certain individuals need quite detailed information. So something like a, a report might be a bit better than a, than a dashboard. Um, alerts and notifications, whether that's within a dashboard, whether that's in Teams, whether that's an email, you know, it's a really great way to let people know that something has happened or they have an action that they need to, um, they need to address. And um, we're finding a lot now that previously things have been email based and no one kind of likes getting spammed with emails. So we've started to see things move to more Teams or, or in dashboards. Um, and then again, workflows. So last item, you know, there's lots of things that you could, or there are lots of processes internally at law firms that you could turn into an automated workflow. So you're kind of reducing down those kind of user, user touch points. Um, so things kind of happen behind the scenes. That also then um, feeds into the conversation around evaluating the technology stack. Um, and there's various different technologies that you can use for this. We, we predominantly work in the Microsoft space, but there is, there is a lot of other technologies out there. Um, and the questions really to ask around, around this when you're, when you're starting these projects. So data sources, you know, how many of them, where are they, what types of data are they, um, whether, they're on, whether they're on cloud or on-prem, big question at the moment for clients. Integrations between those. Are they API integrations? Um, is it a uh, SQL based, say a SSIS package or um, data factory or something like that? Um, cloud on-prem, what frequency do you need to bring data in from those data sources? Um, talking about platforms. So this is where, you know, we start to have conversations around uh, Microsoft, Intap, you know, Power BI versus Tableau, um, Click. Um, and conversations around, uh, around that will also lead on to, you know, performance, um, scalability, you know, is there load balance in those solutions? Um, what are the peak times, data volumes, um, security, what types of security are in these solutions and do those fit for the, for the firm? Um, and cost as well. You know, we spend a lot of, a lot of money on licenses, all, 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 all companies do. So trying to get the most out of your licenses, um, is always a key um, a key factor definitely for the IT teams and, and infrastructure teams out there. Um, things like kind of features and roadmap as well. 
when you're thinking about the tech stack you know you're you're starting to think about what do we want now versus what do we want in the future you know we want to try and future proof future proof ourselves with the technology stack so that you know we're not having to change it in a few years and invest more money in in, in going through that um also skill set as well there's lots of there's lots of products in the market products are changing um changing quite a lot lots of updates um coming through on existing products so you know it's looking at do you have the skill set internally to do these things um what types of skills do you need to do them you know do you need to outsource any of these things to um to a consultancy company or um or any other type of outsourced development company um best practice is to draw up some type of um high level diagram um of your uh, of your technology stack and how it all fits together that then helps drive um the different options that you can use um, for each of those you know, that the conversation of technology stack then comes on to um the actual solutions themselves and i won't spend too long on the design principles just because it's very subjective um lots of clients have different types of dashboards um people will do workflows in different ways um and this in itself could be its own presentation a very long one um but just kind of things to think about as part of these types of projects so if if you're say doing a bi dashboard project um you know try to get relevant stakeholders into design design sessions early uh, and try and um implement some type of feedback loop um, so we we kind of talk about things like design and development methodology, um, waterfall versus agile. Um, we do find clients uh, when we kind of work with them on projects. Projects aren't necessarily always agile. That's the kind of the, the, the big buzzword at the moment. We kind of find when we dig down into them, there's lots of things within there that are more um, waterfall than agile, but you know, it's really what works for your firm. It may be that you start with a bit of a waterfall approach because you have um, a really good idea up front and you want to do some analysis up front on what that is. But from a development perspective, you want to use Agile because you want to be a bit more flexible. You know, you want to have that feedback loop. You want to be including all your stakeholders in, in um, you know, regular meetings and make sure that you're on track, making sure that you can pivot if you need to. So just a couple of items kind of shown on screen at the moment. Um, so with regards to your BI dashboard, you want to understand things like users and personas. You want to understand who your audience is, um, what's their focus, you know, what's their strategic goals, what's their KPIs, any type of security around that. Um, so ethical walls, data level security, role level security. Um, layouts, less is more. We've kind of started to move away from um, throwing the kitchen sink at, at at BI dashboards and more around, you know, what are the key focus areas? Start on those at the kind of the high level summary and then allow users to kind of drill down to the different levels after that. Um, then around kind of visualizations, trying to choose the right KPIs. So if you want to look at trends, you know, you may be using something like a, a line chart or a bar chart. You don't necessarily want to use a pie chart. So it's understanding what types of KPIs work, um, or what types of visuals work for each of your KPIs. If you're looking to start kind of a smart workflow project, um, so look to kind of map out your end-to-end -end, end -end process. Um, understand what's your start point. There are various different places that can be your start point. As I mentioned, it can be a dashboard, it can be teams, it could be a power app, um, lots of different ways to, to, to kick off these processes. Um, understand all of the different steps, all of the different systems involved, um, and knowing if there's any additional overhead to building business logic into these. Um, we find that clients with any kind of manual processes or processes that have existed for some time, there's always business logic that people just know or is in people's heads or is is somewhere in the system and it's just having visibility of that and understanding you know what is the overhead of building that into this um this automated system uh design you know is it a single workflow is it multi-workflow is it nested is it branched um 
outcome you know what's the impact analysis of of um, changing a process internally it comes back to that kind of stakeholder map you know who are all the people who used to be involved in this process you know who's still involved who are those touch points how does that change so just a little bit of a recap on the engines to communicate um, insights and trigger actions uh, so what have we gone through? So agree which engines are best fit for your firm and end users. Evaluating your technology stack. So understanding you know, your current versus future needs. Um, get BI and smart workflow sessions in early and, and create those regular feedback loops um, with those stakeholders. So moving on to step four. So measuring impacts of your BI dashboards and smart workflows. So this is always a little bit of a, a tricky one and it can be quite subjective. So trying to kind of tie back to the impacts of these um, to your firm, some of them may be quite straightforward. So say you have implemented, um, coming back to our example of a, um, a billing workflow, so say you've automated your billing workflow, you know, uh, understanding the measuring the impact is the difference in, in time between what it used to take to what it takes now. Um, uh, you know, the productivity around that. So now that people have got a little bit of time back because they're not doing that, you know, what, what, what areas can they spend that on? And that comes back to hopefully increasing chargeable hours, reducing admin hours, um, less, um, process failure point. So again, this isn't necessarily uh, an easy way to have this on a, on a dashboard, but, you know, assessing, you know, what were your previous failure points? Were there kind of bottlenecks in your process and now you've relieved those or, the, or, or there's a lot less? From a financial perspective, so any cost savings. Um, so that's hopefully a relatively easy one. Um, so you can see your cost savings you know, previous to what to, to what you spent on it before, and that might be software, it might be licenses. Um, and now impact on revenue and profitability. Again, with any with any reduction in your costs, there's always going to be, you know, hopefully a change to your um, well, especially your 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 profitability. Um, but understanding, you know, now you've now you've automated a process, made it quicker, made it easier for people to do things. Um, you know, you could have a look at the number of bills that, that you're now um, generating every month, and hopefully that has an impact on your on your revenue. Um, and then thinking about more of the non-financial stuff um, that sometimes this gets forgotten about, but looking at user experience. So if previously people haven't been able to get information around the firm, you know, it's been very hard. They've had to pull several different um, reports together to, to get something back to the client. Um, now they're able to go to one place to be able to get that. You know, that's that's a that's a great increase in um, user experience. Uh, and that comes on to kind of user, user satisfaction as well. Um, and we find that kind of post-project user satisfaction surveys are great to kind of understand, um, you know, what the value of that project really has been around the firm. Um, and hopefully, you know, if, if if there's any kind of feedback on how the project went, um, can can we do certain things differently next time? You know, that feeds back into that whole process. So it means that, you know, when you next come to do a project, um, hopefully that will then come into your plan. Um, things like data vis visibility and self-service, again, types of user experience. You know, if you've struggled to get that type of information on that visibility and now it's available at your fingertips, um, you know, you're a lot more happy. You don't you don't necessarily need to go through 10 different people um, to get that. So just a little bit of a, a kind of a roundup or conclusion at the end of it. So to run through, you know, what we've gone through in this um, in this webinar, in this masterclass, you know, we've had a look at how can you identify your firm's strategic goals um, and the relevant KPIs? Um, identifying the key actors and their contributions to achieving these goals. Um, choosing the best engine um, that you want to um, give content out to users. 
uh, with, and then measuring the impacts of the BI dashboards and smart workflows that you've implemented um, to the business. Uh, and now hopefully with all of these, if, if you're able to kind of gain feedback from these things, if you're doing them on projects, as I said, hopefully these, these mean that when you come to your next project, you've got you know, a clear idea um, how you want to manage that project and how you want to run that project. So we'll just kind of finish with a Q&A, see if there are any questions from individuals in the group. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Okay, so um, one of them here, regarding workflows, does Pinnacle have a solution for MBI, general payment requests and trust disbursement workflows in Elite 3 Cloud? Um, so with Elite 3 Cloud at the moment, um, there are some limitations on the APIs that you can use in there. Um, Elite are looking to expand those out. Um, so, so what I can do is um, I, I can find out specifically what APIs we can use, um, and I can come back to that individual um, directly over email with, with what we can and can't do in that area. Um, another question here. So... Often good, useful data is not available in a handy spreadsheet or database. Would you recommend, what do you recommend for collecting that information? Any ideas on how to generate AI may, how generative AI may help in this process? Yeah, great question. Um, so we're actually going through a project at the moment um, with a client who, for their management accounts, they have all of their um, general ledger, inf uh, general journal information. So general journals and their prepayments and accruals in offline Excel spreadsheets. Um, so what, what we're doing at that client is, or, or what we have done at that client is we've built out a, a power app for them to collect those um, general ledger transactions. And then what that allows them to do is um, they can start to bring not necessarily their management accounts if they want to keep that in Excel, but um, other types of reports that need that general ledger information, they can now um, have that feed from, um, from the database that sits behind, behind that Power App that can come into their um, Power BI dashboards or it can be used anywhere else they want, they want around the firm. Um, with regards to kind of generative AI and may, um, how that may affect the process, um, I guess... On that side of things, um, we're still looking into the kind of the chatbot and the um, and the natural language side of things, uh, and also Microsoft is starting to put a lot more of that into into Power BI and their and their other apps. Um, as you can see with things like Copilot, if any of you guys have started started trying to use that or have seen that, so that is specifically an area that we are starting to look at. Um, and the hope is that at some point soon we can um, do a couple of presentations and webinars where we can kind of talk about what we've done in that area. Any other questions, guys? No other questions coming through. Um, I suppose from my side, um, please do reach out if you have any questions or um, I'm sure some of the people on the on the call, I'll be working with projects um, either directly already or um, in the future with. Um, but please do reach out to me if you have any questions, um, and I'll, I'll look to answer those and, and get back to you. Uh, 